Hello, my name is Kishwani. That's K E S H W A N I. Kishwani. We are here because we want to prepare for the GMAT. We have been solving GMAT math problems out of this book here, the GMAT Official Guide 2021. If you do not own this book already, purchase one immediately. You're going to need it. Today we will solve some data sufficiency problems that you will find on page number 209. It's important that you have the book in front of you so that you can follow the work. Page 209 beginning with number 308. If after having watched the entire video, if you find it helpful and if you decide that you would like to work with me, that you would like to hire me as your tutor to get you ready for the GMAT, you can reach me at Kashwani Prep at iCloud.com. All right, let's get going. Number three, number 308, the very first one. It says that we have a square, a square A, B, C, D, and we are told that it is inscribed, is inscribed in a circle, in a circle. The question is, what's its area? What's the area of the square? So here is our circle and inside it we have a square. And what we want to find out is the area of this square. They're calling it A, B, C, D. A, B, C, D. Let's see what we are told. In the first statement, in the first statement we are told that the area of the circle, area of the circle is 64 pi. Area of the circle is 64 pi. Let's see what we can do with it. Area of the circle as we know is simply pi r squared and we are told that it is equal to 64 pi. 64 pi. There we go. Pi is going to drop out and this tells us that the radius is 8. The radius of the circle is 8. Let's see what we can do here, shall we? Uh, I shouldn't have drawn it like this. It would help a little bit. I don't know if I should continue with this or not. Let's draw it a different way. It will, it will, it will be easier to work with. It will be easier to work with. Watch what happens. The way you draw this thing, the way is the same thing, but it's easier to look at it with eyes. So let's just first chop up our, chop up our circle in a simple way, the way it is sitting here, and draw our squares like that. This is, this is our square. A, B, C, D. A, B, C, and D. What we just found out is that the radius of the circle is 8, which means this distance from here to here is 8. Let's call this point E. Now, once we know this thing, once we know this thing, we also know that E to C is also 8 because that's also the radius. We can figure out the area of this triangle. We can figure out the area of the triangle because we know the base, we know the height. The base and the height are the same. Once we know the area of the triangle C, D, E, we, all we have to do is multiply it by 4 and we'll have our area. We are looking for the area of the circle, or rather we are looking for the area of the square and we'll have our area of the square. It's just 4 times the area of this triangle which means the first statement by itself is enough. First statement by itself is enough. A, D, B, C, E. Which means answer cannot be B, C or E. It would have to be either A or D. We don't actually have to do it out. Do you understand? In the exam, we don't have to do it out. But we're going to do it here very quickly because just to learn it. So here's our C, D, E, C, E, D. Here is our triangle C, E, D, C, E, D. D is very simple, this is 8 and this is 8, area is going to be 1 half base times height, it's just going to be uh, 4, it's, it's just 32, it's just 32, which means the area of the square that we're looking for is just 32 times 4. But all of that was unnecessary, because we don't have to find out exactly what the area is, we just have to be able to realize that it can be done. Let's look at second statement. And the first statement by, by itself is definitely enough. It's more than enough. Second statement tells us 
Second stem is the same thing. Second stem tells us the circumference of the circle is 16 pi. Circumference of the circle is 16 pi. Again, we know circumference is equal to 2 pi r. 2 pi r. As you can see, pi is going to drop out. And 2 is going to cancel out with 16 is 8. There you go. r equals r equals 8. Same information as before. Once we know the r is 8, we do the same exact thing that we did before to get the area of the square. Second step means also enough. The answer is, answer is D. Answer is D. Number 309. Three hundred and nine. Number three hundred and nine says that K and M are parallel lines. Lines K and M are parallel. The question is, is K positively sloped. I don't know for some reason I have trouble spelling it. Is line K positively sloped? Let's see what we are told. First statement tells us that the line K, line K passes through. 3, 2. Line K passes through 3, 2. And I hope that you're able to spell right away just by looking at it without having to do any work at all because that's the whole idea. As I keep reminding you over and over again, every single problem, these are called data sufficiency. We don't have to actually have to do it out. Do it out. We simply have to realize whether or not we have sufficient data. And I hope you're able to see here that simply knowing that the line goes through one point does not enable us to figure out the slope of the line. And until we know the slope of that line, we cannot say whether or not it is positively sloped. It's not enough. First statement by itself is not enough. A, D, B, C, E. Since first statement by itself is not enough, the answer cannot be A or D. And if you wanted to, we can very quickly actually show, demonstrate that it's not enough. All we know is the line K goes through 3, 2. This part is not necessary. You understand? 1, 2, 3. 1, 2, 3. 1, 2. We, we know that line K goes through this, this point. And the question is, is line K positively sloped? We know that K and M are parallel. Well, we don't know. Maybe line K, line K is like this. Here's your K and here's your M. Or maybe line K is like this. It goes through this point. Here's your K and M. In that case, the K is positively sloped. In this case, it is not. Of course, you cannot tell the slope of the line by simply knowing just one point that it goes through. We have to know two points obviously. We have to know which two points it goes through before we can establish a slope. It's not enough. Second statement says, second statement says that line M, line M passes through, passes through negative 3, 2. Same exact thing. Simply knowing that the line M goes through one point is not going to enable us to establish a slope of the line M. And if we cannot establish a slope of line M, we cannot say anything about the slope of line K. Second statement by itself is also not enough. And again, what we are about to do is not something you will do in the real exam. This is just, just to demonstrate and just to learn. We can very quickly show that it's not going to be enough. 1, 2, 3, 1, 2. We know it goes through this point. We know that M goes through this point. Well, M could be M could be lying like this. Here's your M and here's your K. In which case K is positively sloped, or M could go like that. There are a million different possibilities, in which case it is negatively sloped. Simply knowing that it goes through one point does not enable us to find out the slope. Let's put them together. Let's put them together and see if something happens. If we put them together, if we put them together, this is what we're going to get. 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2. So we know, we know the line K passes through 3, 2. Line K passes through 3, 2. So maybe K is over here. 
and we know the line M has to pass through negative, negative, negative 3 and 2. So there is your K and there is your M. That's one possibility. Another possibility is that all we know is that line K goes through 3, 2. As we have said it over and over again, simply knowing that the line passes through one point does not enable us to figure out whether or not it's positively sloped or negatively sloped because line K, it passes through 3, 2, it passes through 3, 2, but it's, maybe it's like that. And here's a line M. K and M. Now they are negatively sloped. The answer is E. Even, even putting the two steps together does not enable us to say anything at all about the slope of line K, whether it is positively sloped or negatively sloped. But the whole point of this video is to learn the math, to learn the math to be able to realize in the real exam that it can be done. We don't have to do that and we shouldn't do that because doing it out takes forever. All of that work was unnecessary. That problem should have gone like that, simply realizing knowing the line goes through one point is not going to tell us the slope. End of the story. The answer is E. 310. It says that we have a semicircle. We have a semicircular, semicircular tunnel. I do not know why I cannot spell it today. A semicircular tunnel with with radius. 4.2 meters. Let's erase this thing. It's going to get in the way. 4.2 meter. The question is, can a truck go through? Can a truck go through? So there is a truck that is about to go through the tunnel and the question is, can it go through? Now before we, before we dive into this thing, let's ask ourselves what is it that we need to know in order, to figure, in order for us to be able to figure out whether the truck is going to hit the inside of the wall of the tunnel or whether it's going to make it just fine. Let's take a look at it. So here's our, here's our semicircular tunnel. Here's our semicircular tunnel. Here is right in the middle of the tunnel. And if it's just and if the truck is just trying to barely make it through the tunnel, he has to make sure that he goes exactly to the center of it. He cannot go to the side either way. That's what it's going to do. And here is our truck. Here is our truck. The length of the tunnel, uh, the length of the truck, we have to know. The length of the, the width of the width of the width of the truck we need to know. And we need to know the height of the truck. Once we know the width and the height, we can figure out how far this distance is. Let's call it x. How far that distance is, that is the radius of the tunnel. Are you with me so far? That's the radius of the tunnel. And that x that we just showed here cannot equal to the radius of the tunnel. Because if that x equals to the radius of the tunnel, the truck is going to hit the wall. And that's all we have to figure out. Let's see what they give us. It says the maximum maximum width of the truck is 2.4 meter. There you go. Maximum width of the truck is 2.4 meter. This distance right here they just told us. They just told us that this is 2.4 meter. It's a very useful information, but it is not enough. It is not sufficient. Why is it not sufficient? Because we also need to know the maximum height of the truck before we can figure out whether or not it's going to make it through. Because if the width of the truck is 2.4, if the width of the truck is 2.4 and it's, the width is longer than the width of the tunnel, then obviously it's not going to make it through at all. But that's not the issue here. It's not, it's not wide enough. There's plenty of room here because as you can see, we are told that the radius is 4.2, which means from here to here is more than 8 meters. So we are fine with the width. We have to worry about the height. Do you understand? It's not enough. It's not enough. A, D, P, C, E. Answer cannot be A or D. Number two. Maximum. 
maximum height of the truck is 4 meter. There we go. Now we know that this is 4 meter. Again by itself, again by itself is not enough. Again by itself is not enough. Answer cannot be B. But putting it to together, putting them together, we have plenty of information. Answer is C. We know we know its width, we know its height. One more time, one more time. We know the height, we know the width of the truck. If we know the width of the truck, we know this distance. We know this distance from here to here is 1.2 is 1.2. This is 1.2 and that's 4. We can figure out the x because it's a right angle triangle. Once we know the x, which is the outermost edge of the truck, which is the outermost edge of the truck, and as long as that x is less than the radius of the tunnel, that outermost edge of the truck will not touch the wall of the tunnel. And that's what it is. We don't have to do it out. The answer is C. The answer is C. But for learning purposes, we're not going to do it in the real exam, but for learning purposes, let's quickly do it out. It's not a complicated math, it's a very simple Pythagorean theorem. Let's do it out. It's a very simple Pythagorean theorem. So here we go. In the triangle, in this triangle here, triangle ABC, in the triangle ABC, A to C is 1.2, 1.2 squared. B to C is 4 squared and that is equal to X squared and that X squared has to be less than the radius of the tunnel squared the radius of the tunnel squared as long as that X squared is less than the radius of the radius of the tunnel squared we are fine it will not touch the wall let's find out what it is so that's 16 we know 12 squared is 144. I hope you know your square. 12 squared is 144. So 1.2 squared is going to be 1.44 plus 16 is 17.44, which is the x squared. How much is the how much is the radius of the tunnel? We were told. We were told that. Uh, I think we were told somewhere. A semi truck, a semi circular tunnel with a radius 4.2. There you go. 4.2. This has to be. This R squared is 4.2 squared. Let's find out what this 4.2 squared is. As long as this quantity is more than this quantity, we are fine. Let's do, do it right here. 42 times 42. 2 to the 4. 4 to the 8. 8 to the 8. 4 is the 2. 4, 4 times 4 is 16. 4, 16 is 6. 17. There you go. There you go. 17.64. This quantity. This uh, x squared we just found out is 17.44 and r squared we just found out is 17.64. 17 the truck will make it through the tunnel as long as it's a very good driver and he knows precisely what he's doing because there is very little room for the margin of it. There is a very little room for error. Margin of error is very, very tiny. Uh, it's just 0 0.2, 0 0.2 meter or feet or whatever it is. The truck has to be perfectly centered in the tunnel and you make you will make it through. The answer, the answer is statement one and together do give us enough information to be able to answer the question. To be able to answer the question. The point here is not that we are happy because it's going to make it. We really don't give a damn whether he makes it or not. We just have to be able to tell. Is he going to make it? Yes or a no? Answer happens to be yes. Even if the answer turned out to be no, it's still really, from our point of view, makes no difference. We would still say that we have enough information. If this, if this 4.2 happened, happened to be, instead of 17.64, happened to be 17.22, in which case trunk won't make it through, the answer would still be C, because we have enough information to be able to tell yes or no. Number 11. 311. I hope I'm not slacking. I hope I didn't slow down too much. Because the clock ticks, keeps ticking. And it gets to be too much time. Number 11 talks about a group of 50 people. We have a group of 50 people. Question is, 
how many uh, doctors with a low degree there's this group of 50 people some of them are doctors some of them are doctors who happen to have also a low degree the question is how many such doctors are there the first statement tells us that there are 36 doctors 36 doctors that's not going to be enough simply knowing that there are <coughs> 36 doctors in the group out of 50 how can I possibly tell how many of those have low degree it's impossible first statement by itself is not enough A D B C E the answer cannot be A or D we shouldn't make too much fuss about it just use your common sense second one says that 18 have low degrees Sec second one says 18 have, have low degrees but out of these 50 people out of these 50 people now we know that 18 have low degrees but we don't know how many of these 18 people are also doctors and that's the whole point we want to find out people who who are doctors and happen to have a low degree we know it has to be one of these 18 some of these 18 people perhaps even all of the 18 people but we can't really tell just by looking at it we'll have to put them together the answer cannot be b let's put it together in the form of a venn diagram form of a venn diagram okay so we know we know there are 36 doctors there are 36 doctors right here 36 doctors but you have to keep in mind that all of these 36 doctors some of them are also have a lower degree which is what the whole point is some of them are both doctors and lawyers so that goes in here let's call it b for both and we have to take that b away from the 36 how many of them are doctors only how many are the people who have only the doctor's medical degree and no low degree the answer is 36 minus b out of 50. similarly there are 18 people who have low degree and some of them also happen to have a medical degree and we're calling that letter b and there are some there are some who have neither we mustn't forget that who have neither a low degree nor a, a medical degree and here is the equation here is the equation let's put the equation on the top and we'll see whether or not it can be done so this is 36 minus b which is people who are only doctors people who are only doctors people who are only people who only have low degree people who are both people who are neither and all of those has to add up to 50 all of that has to add up to 50 people who are only doctors is 36 minus b people who only have low degrees 18 minus b people who have both of those degrees that's b and people who are neither we're calling it n and that has to equal 50. Do you see a problem here? What we are trying to establish is the value of B. How many of them have both the law degree and a, and a medical degree? And the answer here is even putting it together, all the information together, we still cannot answer what B is because we also have N. We have two unknown, we have two unknown and only one variable. It's, it cannot be done. It cannot be done. We cannot figure out what the value of B is until we know how many people out of those 50 have neither of those two degrees they are neither doctors nor lawyers it cannot be done I forget that what number it was we'll find out in a second that was number 311 311 let's take a look at number 12 Number 12 it says, 312 it says that out of out of 50 households out of 50 households how many how many have a cat or a dog but not both but not both 
And again, before we do the work, why don't we set it up? It's just like the last time, just like the problem that we just finished, the Venn diagram. Let's find out what it is that we're looking for. Here we go, okay? So let's just set it up. So here C represents the people who have only cats. C means number, number who have number of household who have only cats. That's what C stands for here. B would stand for number of households who have only dogs. This is the people who have both. People who have both. And N would be people who have neither. People who have neither. Let's see what they give us. Now that we understand how we set it up, Again, you understand the C stands for people who have cats and only cats. Do you understand? So how many people total how many total people have cats? The answer is C plus B. Because there are B number of people who have both cats and a dog. So if, you, if the question is how many of the household have only cats, the answer is C. If the question is how many of the households have cats, the answer is C plus B. Because they also have some dog. Some of them also have dogs. Let's, let's continue. It's important that how we're going to set it up before we before we dive into it. It says four have a cat and a dog. Oh, what do you know? Cat and a dog. Four of them have cats and a dog. So now we know that B equals four. And this thing B equals four. But the question is. How many of them have a cat or a dog but not both? So what we're looking for here is B plus sorry, rather. What we're looking what, what we're looking for is C plus D. C plus D is what we're looking for here. C represents the people household who have only cats. How many of them have a cat or a dog but not both? So C represents the household that have only cats. D represents the number of households who have only dogs. And that is the question. How many households have either only cat or only dog? That's what we're looking for. Well, what, what we're just given is B. That's not enough information. We need to, little bit, we need to know a little bit more. Maybe, maybe we can figure out how many of them have neither in the second statement. But first statement by itself is not enough. We know they're all together 50. We know they're all together 50. So first statement by itself is not enough. A, D, B, C, E. Answer cannot be A or D. Second statement says, oh there you go, 14 have no cat and no dog. There we go, we're done. Second statement by itself is not enough. Second statement by itself is not enough, but putting it together will do the job beautifully. Will do the job nicely. I'm going to change the color so we can see it. Because you see, we don't have to figure out we don't want to figure out the C and D individually. That's not possible here. It's not possible to figure out the value of C individually. It is not possible to figure out the value of D individually. If that's what you're trying to figure out, you're missing the point. We don't care what, what C is. We do not care what D is. We're simply interested in their sum. And that can be ascertained. Because we know now B is 4. We know this guy is 4. We know. We know that this guy is 4. And we are just told that 14, n is 14, there we go, n is 14. And all together there are 50 of them. So we can figure out C plus D. We don't have to do it in the exam, we just have to realize that it can be done. The answer is, the answer is C. The answer to this problem is C. Putting the two statements together will do the job nicely. What we are about to do is not something we'll do in the real exam. As I keep reminding you every single time. So let's do it out, not something not something we will waste our time in the real exam. So let's do very quickly. Number of households who have only cats. Number of households who have only cats. Number of households who have only dogs. Number of households who have both. And number of households who have neither. Has to add up to 50. We know B is 4. We are told in the first statement. First statement tells us there are 4 households that have both cat and a dog. Second statement tells us there are 14 households that have neither. But there you go, now we can figure out C plus D. C plus D must equal C plus D must equal 50 minus 18. Whatever that happens to be. 
50 minus 20 would have been 30, so it's 32. Out of this 50 households, out of these 50 households that we're talking about, 32 of them have either just a cat or just a dog, but not both. Number 313. 313, I believe, is the last one in the column. So let's see what we're going to do here. Yeah, 13 says that we invested 12 thousand dollars in two investments X and Y we are told they both earned same, they both earn same amount of interest. In other words, they both yielded the same return. They both yielded the same return as in dollar amount, absolute dollar amount. Question is, how much, how much was invested? in Y. Let's see what they tell us. First statement tells us that investment X paid 3%. X paid 3%. What else does it tell us? Oh, there you go. And Y paid 6%. Y paid 6%. Oh, there you go. If we know if we know the return on both of them, this guy paid 3%, this guy paid 6%, and the total is 12,000, part of that 12,000 will put in investment S, and part of that 12,000 will put in investment Y, it should say Y. The second investment, part of the investment will put in, uh, in this investment Y, uh, to be precise, it's going to be 12,000 12, minus X, whatever amount we've invested in X, 12,000 minus X was put in here, and that in return 6%, of course we can answer how much was invested in Y. The first claim by itself is quite sufficient. A, D, B, C, E. Since, since we know that the first statement by itself is enough, there is enough information there, it can be done. It can be done. There is plenty of information to be, for us to be able to solve it, which means the answer cannot be B, C, or E. Now, if you wanted to, just for learning purposes, we can do it out. We can do it out. So let's put here, and the investment and return is the same. Return, amount of the return is the same. So let's put it here. Y paid, Y paid 6%. So 3% of X, I'm going to use, I'm going to use small letter X to represent the amount of money invested in investment X. Big letters are, the, are their names and a small letter is the amount of money that we invested in investment X. 3% of X has to equal 6% of Y because we were told that they both are the same amount of interest but Y we have to understand the Y is simply equal to 12 minus 12 minus X because the amount of money that we invested in investment X and the amount of money that we invested in investment Y has to add up to 12,000 so Y is simply 12 minus X Let's see what we can do, shall we? Let's continue. So, 3% of x, 3% of x is simply 3 over 100 times x has to equal 6 over 100 times 12 minus x. And I hope that by now at least you're able to see that this is all of this is unnecessary. All of this is just a waste of time, something that will never in a million years do in the real exam because it is not required. But we can clearly see we can solve for x. And once we can solve for x, we can figure out the amount of y. Amount that we invested in y, which is simply 12 minus x. It can be done very easily. Let's finish it up. Let's multiply both sides by 100. If we multiply both sides by 100, the 100 is going to drop out. Let's divide both sides by 3. If we divide both sides by 3, 3 is going to drop out and 6 is going to become 2. 
and here we're left with only x. x equals 2 times 12 minus x, 12 minus x, which gives us 2 times ne 2 times negative 2x, which is going to negative 2x. When we bring it here, it's going to become positive 3x. 2x and 1x become three, positive 3x equals 2 times 12, and therefore we divide both sides by 3 again. Uh, if you divide by 3, it should be 4, not 12 divided by 3 is 4. So 2 times 4, x equals 8. x equals 8. The question was how much was invested in y? The answer is 4. Of course the answer is 4, because if they earned the same amount of interest, and this guy was paying twice, much in, twice as much interest as this guy, this is paying 3%, this is paying 6%, Obviously, whatever amount you invested here, you have to only invest half as much here. That's all we have to do here. We have to under, if if you had realized this earlier, this is very straightforward. It's twelve thousand. So you're going to put two part in one, one part in the other. There's three parts. It's twelve thousand. So you put eight thousand and four thousand. That's all. Because of the fact that it's nice three and six percent, it's exactly twice the interest rate. The first statement by itself is enough. First statement by itself is enough, which is why the answer is either A or D. Let's see what the second statement tells us. Let's see what the second statement tells us. Second statement says the amount invested in X was more than $1,000 was more than one thousand dollars. That's just that's just too silly. Simply knowing that you invested more than one thousand dollars in X is not going to tell us how much you put in Y. That's just silly. Second statement by itself is not enough. The answer is A. Second statement by itself is not enough. The answer is A. That was the end of the first column. Number 313 is what we just finished. That was the end of the first column on page number 209. We're going to do the second column a day after tomorrow. Tomorrow we'll go back to multiple choice problems and we'll make, we'll make some progress there. As I said in the beginning of the video, if you wish to work with me, if you found this helpful and if you would like to hire me as your tutor to get you ready for the GMAT, just send me an email, kishwaniprep at icloud.com and we'll see what we can do. Alright? Bye now.